pleasure and an honor for me to introduce our speaker today, Professor Philip Griffiths uh, from uh, the Institute of Urban Study of Princeton and University of Miami. And here we talk today about some appli geometric application of Hodge theory. Okay. Thank you and uh, thank you to the organizers for the invitation to uh, give this talk. Um, on the screen, I've listed a brief outline of some of the things that I will try to speak about. Uh, there won't be time to cover all those topics, and I think the notes are available on the website with uh, what I won't be able to talk about today together with references and uh, to, uh, you know, to some of the things that will be spoken about. Modern hard theory is a subject that both is of some interest in its own right. People work on just pure Hodge theory, but it's also a subject that's used in uh, many areas of uh, mathematics. And today the emphasis in this talk will be on the latter, that is the uses of Hodge theory. Uh, rather than the subject of Hodge theory itself. Uh, I will give some brief historical uh, introduction, very historical, in fact. Um, you know, I think the question of where did Hodge theory come from uh, is one that is of some interest and the early stages are perhaps less well known than some of the more recent developments. So I'll say a few words about those. And then I'll talk about some of the uses of Hodge theory in different areas of mathematics. Hodge theory itself relates to many areas of mathematics, to analysis. Uh, today I'll give the historical comments mainly dealing with the classical complex analysis origins of the subject, but those other aspects of analysis do have Hodge theory relations. Differential geometry, I think in Hodge theory, uh, there has been fairly widespread use of differential geometric techniques uh, proving things like general type and log general type properties of various algebraic varieties like moduli spaces. Uh, I won't have time to get into those today. Uh, topology, I will say something about uh, the topology of smooth varieties, uh, the topology of general algebraic varieties, uh, singular, non-complete sort of mixed Hodge theory. Intersection cohomology uh, is again an important area that Hodge theory enters. I won't have a chance to say much about that. Families of algebraic varieties, the topology in a family where singular members appear when a smooth algebraic variety degenerates to something singular is a central topic and one where Hodge theory has played uh, a very basic role. I'll say a few things about that. Finally, Lie theory uh, is again an area uh, where Hodge theory has had some relations. I think, for example, the original construction of the discrete series representations of real semi-simple Lie groups done by Wolfrich Schmidt was done based on Hodge theoretic considerations. Uh, so there has been, of course, uh, other constructions of the discrete series, but the first geometric realizations were, uh, had their origins from Hodge theory. And finally, algebraic geometry, uh, that's the main area where Hodge theory does interact with uh, other aspects of mathematics. And I'll say a few words about that, especially the parts of algebraic geometry that relate to moduli. Other parts, uh, the main conjecture, Hodge conjecture, mirror symmetry, things like that, I won't have a chance to say much about. 
Specifically, the use of Hodge theory to study moduli uh, requires some geometric constructions arising from Hodge theory and frequently some sort of Torelli property. A Torelli property means that the Hodge structure that one associates to an algebraic variety uh, captures a lot of the information on the algebraic variety. And in the presence of Torelli properties, then Hodge theory, I think, does provide a very useful tool for the study of moduli. So where did Hodge theory originate from? Uh, there's really no one point, I think, that one can say Hodge theory began here. But to me, uh, one of the main sources arose out of uh, almost ordinary calculus, the integrals of algebraic functions as written here. An algebraic function is a function that is multi-valued and it's given by a function y of x that satisfies a polynomial equation as written here. And the integrand then involves both x and this multi-valued function y of x. <clears throat> These things arose throughout classical mathematics and differential geometry and mechanics. Uh, today I'm going to restrict to a particular polynomial of uh, quadratic and y, so p is the square root, or y of x is the square root of p of x. And talk about the integrals of those of the functions that arise from that algebraic function. The integral you have to understand is taking place in the complex plane along a path and voiding the roots of the polynomial. And if the degree of the polynomial is two, then these integrals can be evaluated. They're in books of tables, uh, evaluated in terms of elementary functions, trig functions and logarithms. Uh, example here, there's a geometric reason for that. If you have a degree two polynomial, then uh, again, using complex numbers, the equation f of x, y equals zero is a conic and a conic is parameterized by a line by using stereographic projection. Changing variables in the integral, it reduces it to the integral of a rational function and then one uses partial fractions. So you just get elementary functions that way. As soon as the degree is at least three, the whole character of this integral changes. Uh, and that was one of the major issues of 19th and early 20th century mathematics was to understand such integrals. Just a word about what is meant by the integral. You have to choose a path of integration. That's this lambda here. And what I've done for the case where P is of degree two, so G is zero, I've slit the complex plane between the two roots in the here minus one one. And in the slit complex plane, you choose a single valued branch of the square root of P. And you integrate along that path. Uh, the path is not unique. You can do like in the middle figure and travel around the slit. And using Cauchy's theorem, the integral from this is equal to the integral around the slit plus the original one. So it's, in other words, these integrals are not single valued. They have periods that depend on the choice of path. If you invert the integral by defining the upper limits of integration as what you get by evaluating the integral, then the period, then the multivaluedness, the choice of path, translates into periodicity of these functions. If you just think about it, that's uh, 
you know, your choice of path is reflected in the upper limits of integration by inverting the integral being periodic. Sine and cosine are the obvious examples. If you try to do the same thing when G is one, that is you have a quartic polynomial, so you have four roots and there'll be two slits and one branch of the square root is in one copy of the complex plane and you have the rule that when you analytically continue the square root and cross a slit, you change from the plus to the minus, change to the other square root. So you get two different types of site of closed paths that arise when you try to evaluate those integrals. That means you have doubly periodic functions. So analytically, when G is zero, these integrals have singularities at infinity. You just change variable and look at them. Uh, when G is one, then these integrals are all finite. They have no singularities. They're not single valued, but you'll never get uh, a pole. So both the topology and the analytic behavior changes when you go from g equals zero to g equals one. And the reason, one reason is topological. If you slit the plane and attach two copies of the plane in this way, this is the case where you had two slits, open up the slits and make a tube and then stick them together. You get the Riemann sphere and the two singularities of the integral are then the points plus or minus infinity. Whereas for G equals one, you get the familiar way of constructing a torus, a genus one surface. So what about the general integral? Uh, that's what occupied a lot of the classical mathematicians uh, to try to get some understanding of what you do with that integral. And the resolution of that question, or what's generally considered to be the resolution of the question was given by Abel. He said, don't just look at the one fixed curve, but intersect it with a family of curves depending rationally on a parameter. Just think of a family of lines and write the points of intersection as these are the X and Y coordinates, write them in this way. And instead of just looking at that single integral, looking at what's called an abelian sum, you integrate from a base point to all of these point, upper points. And I will prove that the derivative of this thing is a rational function. So the individual summands are these very highly transcendental, very mysterious integrals of algebraic functions that we started with but the abelian sum is something understandable. It's an elementary function. And that has all sorts of consequences by making special choices of F and H. Uh, one, whoops, one uh, is led to the classical theory of elliptic functions. That's when G equals one or when g is bigger than or equal to one, one is led to uh, the Jacobian variety of an algebraic curve. I'll say more about that in a minute. <clears throat> Going back to the analytic part of the story, Abel defined the genus <clears throat> of this algebraic curve as the dimension of the space of those things you integrate that were everywhere finite. So it's a finite dimensional vector space and that was the definition. First use of that word that I know actually was in his paper. That was his definition of the genus. The next steps were done by Jacobi, but especially by Riemann who proved that this analytic invariant was one, a topological one. It's one half the first Betty number. And in modern terms, really what he proved is that the first cohomology is a direct sum of, in Durham cohomology, of the part spanned by these differentials. 
so-called holomorphic differentials on the associated Riemann surface and their complex conjugates. And this is a Hodge structure of weight one. The first cohomology is a direct sum of a subspace and its conjugate. And it satisfies two Hodge Riemann bilinear relations coming just from cup product and cohomology. In the notes, there's some discussion of the next stages that were taken in sort of classical Hodge theory. Those were about Picard. And to some extent, he worked out a large part of what is now called the Hodge theory of an algebraic surface. Uh, there is in the notes a discussion of what he did. And <clears throat> I'm going to, I think, just leave that aside just for lack of time. <clears throat> so the second part of the talk is just a quick review of the objects of Hodge theory. This is in order to explain how it's used in some geometric problems later on. So a polarized the Hodge structure is given by a vector space with a bilinear form of rational vector space and a filtration on the conjugation on the com on the complexification that satisfies this con opposite condition. That's a Hodge structure on a vector space. And the usual or the more common classically version of this was to look at the so-called PQ decomposition of the complexification. You decompose the complexification as a direct sum of subspaces where the conjugate of PQ is QP. So this is the definition of VPQ given F, and this is the definition of F given the VPQs with this Hodge decomposition. That's a Hodge structure of weight N. The polarization arises from a bilinear form with two re bilinear relations uh, that I won't need, so I won't write them out here. So this is a classical Hodge structure and the theorem, Hodge's theorem in the 1930s is that the cohomology of a smooth algebraic variety has a polarized Hodge structure of weight n. So he always thought of the algebraic variety as embedded in projective space. So it has an ample line bundle and from that you get a polarization. So a better way of saying it is that the cohomology has a Hodge structure. Given an ample line bundle, that Hodge structure gets a polarization. The next steps were taken by Deline in the 60s uh, to extend the notion of a cohomology having a Hodge structure to singular or an arbitrary algebraic variety by introducing the notion of a mixed Hodge structure. It's a vector space with two filtrations, one over Q and one over C, like a Hodge filtration, with the property that the Hodge filtration induces on the graded quotients of regular pure Hodge structure of weight K. So although the Complexification does not have a Hodge decomposition. It has a Hodge Deline decomposition into subspaces IPQ, where the weight filtration or the direct sum where the P plus Q is less or equal to K. And instead of the conjugation relation being an equality, it's a congruence. The conjugates are the same, or the conjugation relation holds modulo stuff of weight too less than what you're working in. So this is the property of mixed hot structures that's frequently used to prove, for example, that they form an abelian category and things like that. Main example uh, before I said was the firma. 
of uh, the hot structure on an arbitrary algebraic variety. Coming back to mixed hot structures in practice, there's frequently an integral lattice in the rational vector space. Think of integral cohomology. So the mixed hot structure is a successive extension of pure hot structures. And the associated gradeds are pure hot structures, and then you have the level one extensions, the level two extensions, and so on. For example, the level one extensions are just X1s in the category of mixed hot structures. In general, the set of at most K fold iterated extensions gives a sequence of vibrations, K fold extension over K minus one fold extension. The fibers of this are again X ones in the category of mixed hot structures. A higher X in the category of mixed hot structures are all zero. So it's a more subtle relation than just taking all the X. The X1 is the only one that appears. The higher extensions uh, have a different character. Next object is a variation of hot structure. That's given by a local system over a quasi-projective variety, having a filtration by sub-bundles on the uh, corresponding holomorphic vector bundle. So you have a local system tensor with the holomorphic functions, you get a holomorphic vector bundle. This filtration should induce a Hodge structure on each fiber. So it's just a family of Hodge structures depending holomorphically on parameters. And the covariant derivatives, the thing that defines the local system, shifts the Hodge filtration by one. There's also in practice horizontal, that is horizontal bilinear forms that polarize the Hodge structures, but I won't uh, get into those here. Here the main example is a smooth family of projective varieties where the local system is just the cohomology along the fiber the Hodge structures on the fibers are given by these Hodge, uh, by the sub-bundles, and the delta is the so-called gauss in connection. So the sec local sections satisfying delta equals zero just geometrically are cohomology classes that are parallel translated along a path when you pass from one smooth variety to the next, the topology doesn't change. You just move the cohomology class along with the, along the path. Last object is an infinitesimal variation of Hodge structure. It's a very simple linear algebra object, the graded vector space with a map, linear map. So it's two vector spaces and a linear map satisfying this integrability condition. This means that E is a sim T module, so module over a polynomial ring. And the basic example is the associated graded to the very, to the, to the, of the Hodge bundles to the vector bundle that arises from the local system and T is the tangent bundle. And this condition here, those two conditions are just re reflections of delta squared equals zero and this condition here. Finally, a special type of mixed hot structure is a limiting mixed hot structure. So it's a particular type of mixed hot structure where the weight filtration arises from a nilpotent endomorphism. Nilpotent endomorphisms give unique filtrations satisfying this condition. They decrease the filtration level by two. There's a hard Lefschetz type of uh, condition that the associated graded above the middle in the filtration 
So the, will, the weight filtration goes from zero to two M, I should have written that. And the powers of N give you an isomorphism around the middle of the, around the, middle of the associated gradient. And N drops the F, the Hodge filtration, by one. There are also bilinear forms, which I'm not going to get into, but one always has those. Uh, in when you go to use Hodge theory in geometry. Here the basic example is having a family of, or a variation of Hodge structure over a punctured disc. And one knows then the monodromy. Uh, so if whenever you have a local system, you have a monodromy gotten by moving parallel sections around closed paths, it's known that the monodromy is quasi-unipotent. It's Jordan decomposition. The semi-simple part is a finite order. The eigenvalues are roots of unity. And the unipotent part is unipotent of index M. Basic theorem is that Schmidt, from due to Schmidt, is that whenever you have a variation of Hodge structure over a punctured disk, it has a limiting mixed Hodge structure associated to the origin. So it, it actually, it, operationally, you can just think of the family of pure Hodge structures as having a limit. The limit is a limiting mixed Hodge structure. This, Instruction was extended to several parameters by Katani, Kaplan, Schmidt, and using the various properties that, that were proved by Katani, Kaplan, Schmidt, one knows that there are canonical extensions of the Hodge bundles. So here, what I'm thinking of is that you have B in this case is a product of punctured disks and regular disks. That's like a smooth variety with you take out a normal crossing divisor. And the normal crossing divisor I'm calling Z. And the generators of the fundamental group around the branches of the normal crossing divisor, those are, those are the coordinate axes that you take out, uh, it's our abelian, and there's a canonical Deligne extension of the Hodge bundles over this open variety across the divisor, the normal crossing divisor you took out, call it B bar. And the Gauss-Menin connection has logarithmic poles. I think I won't get into this. Um, I'll just say that that local situation can be globalized where you have a pair consisting of a smooth projective variety, a normal crossing divisor, a variation of Hodge structure over the open part with unipotent monodromies around the branches of the normal crossing divisor, and you get this canonical Deligne extension. So those are the objects that one has to use in uh, applying Hodge theory to geometry. Going now back to the very beginnings, so one can, well, one asks, okay, one has Hodge, one has these various objects uh, associated to, uh, to the cohomology of, a of an algebraic variety or a family of algebraic varieties. They're basically linear algebra type objects. How can you use them? What use can you make of them to study the geometry of the variety? The classical example, uh, which is due to Riemann, is this. For a weight one polarized Hodge structure, there's associated to it a complex torus and a line bundle. The line bundle comes from the polarization. The Hodge-Riemann bilinear relations 
So what this is, is you take the Hodge decomposition, that's an uh, V10 directs on V01, and you just quotient the lattice into the second part. That's what this complex torus is. The Hodge Riemann bilinear relations tell you that this is a positive line bundle, so it's ample. If it's unimodular, then one knows just from the study of line bundles over compact complex tori that the space of sections is one dimensional. So there is up to translation from the linear algebra data, a geometric object, a divisor in the compact complex torus. In case the polarized Hodge structure arises from the H1 of an algebraic curve, then there is going back to Abel, the map of the curve to the Jacobian, given just by integrating the holomorphic differentials from a base point to an upper limit. That integral is well-defined modulo periods. So that's why in the definition of the torus, you mod out by the integral stuff. And using abelian sums, as again, Abel introduced, not just the compact Riemann surface itself, the algebraic curve, but the symmetric powers. That is, the point here is just a sum of points, a collection of points up, uh, not, yeah, a collection of points on the, on the compact Riemann surface. You map that to the abelian sum. Okay. As I said, this was from really trace the origins of this construction, go back to Abel's original theorem. Riemann proved then that the image of the G minus one fold symmetric product. So the torus has dimension G. You take a set of G minus one points and form this abelian sum, map it into the torus, and that gives you something that's a divisor, co-dimension one subvariety of the torus. And Riemann proved that up to translation, that's the theta divisor. So if you give me the Hodge structure, you get this. And if you have this, then you have the G minus one fold symmetric product of the curve. Much of the geometry of the curve can be read off from this construction here. For example, when G is two, you get the curve back itself. And in general, from this, one can prove the Torelli theorem that the polarized hot structure determines the curve. Okay. Turns out that this is a very special uh, construction that only can take, only works uh, when you are in what's called the classical case. The classical case are Hodge structures either of weight one or of weight two, where the first Hodge number, the H20, is one. They're characterized by saying that the space of polarized Hodge structures with a given set of Hodge numbers, that's dimensions of these HPQ, of the VPQs, is fixed, is called a period domain. And the case where it's Hermitian symmetric is the case where this infinitesimal period relation, the differential constraint in a variation of Hodge structure is trivial. That's the classical case. And it's only in the classical case that you can associate to a Hodge structure itself, something geometric. Okay, that's explained here. However, if you have not just the Hodge structure itself, but the first variation of it. So think of a family of smooth varieties. Suppose that you have a particular smooth variety and its first variation. That gives you an infinitesimal variation of Hodge structure. And those have proved rather useful as surrogates for the theta divisor in the classical case. For example, I was about two weeks ago, uh, a very nice theorem due to Shepard Barron was posted on the archive. If you have an elliptic surface with no multiple fibers and this constraint, this inequality on the Hodge numbers, H10 
is the dimension of the space of holomorphic one forms on the algebraic surface, H20, the dimension of the space of holomorphic two forms. Then the polarized hot structure on the second cohomology generically determines X. Okay. And his proof used the geometry of the particular X together with the geometry that arises from the first variation of its hot structure. An even more classical example of this type of uh, construction is the theorem of Donaghy and Green going back to the 80s, which says that for smooth hypersurfaces in projective space, uh, the infinitesimal variation of hot structure is given algebraically in this way, it's a polynomial ring modulo the ideal, the Jacobian ideal. And they prove that except in a few cases of the degree, this ring determines the, the well, first the infinitesimal variation of Hodge structure determines this ring. And from this ring, you can determine the Jacobian ideal up to the action of PGL. So it's again a generic, type of Torelli theorem that from the Hodge structure, uh, well, if you like the mapping from the moduli space to the space of Hodge structures has degree one. That's really what it means. An even more classical example of the infinitesimal variation of Hodge structure that goes back to, uh, again, algebraic curves is the Torelli theorem for curves, the generic Torelli theorem, but a different proof, not using the theta divisor. In this case, the infinitesimal variation of Hodge structure has a nice algebra geometric interpretation. You take the holomorphic differentials, take the second symmetric product, and just multiplying them, you get holomorphic quadratic differentials, sections of the square of the canonical bundle. For G bigger than or equal to three and X non-hyperelliptic, this map is surjective. It's a theorem of Max Noerder. That's local Torelli. The differential of the period map dualized is just this map. So if it's onto, you get the local Torelli theorem the kernel of this map are the quadrics through the space of the canonical curve. I won't explain that here, but it's for non-hyperliptic curves, it's a canonical way of sticking the curve in projective space. And again, for large G, Nerder proved that the intersection of the quadrics was the curve. So here you're reconstructing the curve directly from its infinitesimal variation of Hodge structure. That's the sort of model example one has in mind when you try to do things in higher dimensions. Finally, a recent example that's in some ways reminiscent of the theta divisor is when you go to a pair, the smooth complete variety with a normal crossing divisor, the variation of Hodge structure canonically extended to the complete variety and look at the extension data of the limiting mixed hot structures. So what we're doing is looking over infinity over Z at not the hot structures, but the limiting mixed hot structures. And here we're especially interested in the extension data. What can we extract geometrically from those? The level one extension data, the X1 that I wrote down before is a compact complex torus. The tangent space is a Hodge structure of weight minus one with Hodge decomposition like this. The part in the middle is of interest for a reason I'll explain in a moment. The level two extension data fibers over the level one with Hodge tangent space, again, having hot structures whose hot decomposition looks like this. So why is this interesting? If you think of having a family of algebraic varieties, smooth algebraic varieties like a moduli space, 
and you complete that by throwing in singular varieties over the boundary of moduli and resolving the singularity so you have a normal crossing divisor, then you want to study the geometry of uh, the moduli space at infinity. What sort of singular varieties appear in the boundary of moduli? Okay. You'd like to use Hodge theory to get some insight into that question. And the basic fact that is being used is that over the level one extension data, there is a, using the polarizations, the fact that you have limiting mixed hot structures, there's an ample line bundle. There's a line bundle that using the differential constraint is ample on the image. So what that means is that if you are at infinity and you look at the variation of the extension data, then you get something like a theta, uh, an ample line bundle on an abelian variety. You actually get a sub variety of that. And the basic geometric result is that that ample line bundle restricted to a sub variety along which the associated graded remains constant is related to the co-normal bundle of these divisors in B bar. So the geometry along the fiber and the geometry normal to the fiber are related in this way. So this is the sort of picture. And what is turning out to be the case is that that picture is providing a guide to how one might compactify moduli spaces of, of curves is very classical of uh, higher dimensional varieties, especially algebraic surfaces. The moduli space of algebraic surfaces of general type has been constructed some years ago by Kolar, Shepard, Baron, and Alexiev. But so far, there's not any single example that's been worked out of what the moduli looks like, what the boundary looks like. It's not like curves where you know uh, what, exactly what the boundary looks like. So let me just give some heuristic reasoning that will suggest how you can use Hodge theory to guess what you should put on the boundary. And I think I will start here. You have a, a moduli space for general type surfaces. It has a canonical completion. I want to assume the moduli space is smooth. In this example, I'll give that's the case. And a general point corresponds to a smooth regular surface. One can ask, what surfaces appear on the boundary? And can Hodge theory suggest how you might construct a desingularization of that boundary? So the answer to these questions is affirmative. Uh, it's discussed in one of the references. And the geometric reason goes as follows. One has, from Hodge theory, one has a pretty complete understanding of what the boundary of the space of Hodge structures looks like. These are limiting mixed Hodge structures and they've been classified by a number of people. So one knows, if you like, from Lee theory, what the Hodge theoretic boundaries are. You'd like to use Hodge, you'd like to use geometric reason to let that information serve as a guide for suggesting what surfaces, what geometric objects should you stick in on the boundary? So the principal boundary component uh, n squared is zero and the rank of n is two. Okay. So suppose you have a family of surfaces degenerating and the monodromy satisfies this property. It's the generic, if you like, the highest level uh, it's the largest dimension in the space of ends for limiting mixed hot structures. The associated graded of the limiting mixed hot structure 
has hot, pure hot structures of degree one, degree two, and the Tate twist of degree one. Since the rank of N is two, that, suggest, that means that the H1 is the H1 for a smooth elliptic curve. So that suggests that the singular surface should have something to do with this elliptic curve that appears in the limit of the Hodge structures. So suppose we have a degeneration where the surfaces are smooth for T non-zero and you have some normal surface. So it's a surface, a singular surface, but it's normal corresponding to a point of the boundary. What is suggested here is that that normal surface should have a simple elliptic singularity and the curve that arises in the resolution of the singularity should be this curve here that arises from the limiting mixed Hodge structure. So point number one is you expect the principal boundary component to be normal surfaces with a simple elliptic singularity. I didn't write it out here, but the degree of the singularity, C squared, which is negative, is read off from the semi-simple part of monodromy. Okay. So you not only know the curve, but you know what its C squared is, what it's, uh, what the degree of the elliptic singularity is. Now I'll go back to Hodge theory. If you have a desingularization of moduli, so instead of over the origin, you have this singular surface, the one with the elliptic singularity. Suppose you desingularize moduli so that you get a family over uh, some covering of the disk where the total space is smooth. That's a so-called semi-stable reduction. So what do you expect over the origin here? There's from Clement Schmidt, that's something you construct from the limiting mixed Hodge structure. The fiber of this desingularization of the origin should have a double curve, okay? And no triple points. The simplest way to get that is to desingularize the limit surface and glue it to a smooth surface along this curve, okay? Well, we know what X tilde is supposed to be. That's the desingularization of the limit surface. We know what C is. We know what C squared is. What should this Y be? It should be a smooth surface containing C. C is a smooth elliptic curve. So the simplest place to find smooth elliptic curves is P2. The normal bundle of C and X tilde has degree that I mentioned before. And the necessary condition to have the smoothability of this fiber over the origin to have it be smooth, to have a smooth total space is that the normal bundle of C and X tilde should be dual to the one and Y. So that suggests that you, you, that for smoothability, you should blow up nine points on the curve in P2. The reason for nine is, again, any smoothable elliptic singularity has degree at most nine. Okay. So this bounds the degree and the surface that you're going to glue in is a del pezzo. So what the limiting mixed Hodge structure is telling you is that to desingularize the moduli space along the principal boundary component of normal surfaces with simple elliptic singularities, you want to stick in uh, uh, del pezzos and del pezzos, to the, which del pezzo is, to, is given to you by the degree. Okay. What about these points? This, where do you, what, what are those points supposed to be? Well, you look in the extension data of the limiting mixed Hodge structure, and the extension data is essentially the obel jacobi image of the differences of these points. So 
what you're reading often from the limiting mixed hot structure is the type of surface to stick in when you'd want to desingularize moduli what the semi-stable reduction should look like and how you should glue the two smooth pieces together. Okay, that's coming off the extension data and the limiting mixed hot structure. So this is a very um, brief uh, discussion of how one would like to use Hodge theory in the study of moduli. It's a combination of Hodge theoretic and algebra geometric reasons. The last few minutes, I want to say just a few words about other uses of Hodge theory. Um, first is to in topology. Um, in topology, there are two famous theorems of Lefschetz. The first is the hyperplane, Lefschetz hyperplane theorem. You take a smooth variety, you intersect it with a generic hyperplane, and then the cohomology is the same up to two less than the dimension of X. And this map is injective for, for N minus one. This is the Lefschetz, the uh, so-called Lefschetz theorem. Um, actually, this theorem was proved by Picard for surfaces. And Lefschetz's argument, as he says in his book, is just an extension of Picard's argument to the general case. Um, it's noteworthy that this is a topological theorem. That is, if we have a topological situation where you have a smooth manifold X, a real co-dimension two smooth manifold Y, and you have a picture of Y and X that looks topologically like what you get in algebraic geometry when you vary Y and you acquire ordinary double points, uh, these are the vanishing cycles. And in Morse theory, it's like attaching a cell of index exactly equal to the dimension. Uh, you get the Lefschetz theorem. It's a topological theorem. If you have a picture that looks topologically like the algebra geometric one, then you have the Lefschetz theorem. The other result of Lefschetz concerns the cup product gotten by taking the hyperplane raised to the case power and mapping the cohomology below the middle dimension, symmetrically above the dimension, middle dimension. Lefschetz's theorem is that that's an isomorphism. It's called hard Lefschetz. Uh, the reason for the hard is in many senses it is deeper than the first Lefschetz theorem I mentioned. Interestingly, Lefschetz's original topological argument for this theorem was incomplete. Uh, and it was partly in seeking to give a proof of the hard Lefschetz theorem that Hodge originated Hodge theory. Uh, he proved that the cohomology of a smooth variety has a hot structure, a polarized hot structure, but also, he proved this hard Lefschetz theorem. Uh, it was a tour de force, if you look at how he did it. This is a Hodge theoretic result, not a topological one. One can construct examples that topologically look like the case in algebraic geometry, but for which hard Lefschetz is false. Um, as is commented on in the notes and in the, in the references, Picard actually stated the hard Lefschetz theorem for surfaces. And I think his proof is correct because the Hodge theory that he needed was there. The Hodge theory had to do with the Hodge theory of the Y, the hyperplane section. That's an algebraic curve on an algebraic surface. And one knew for algebraic curves, the Hodge theory in H1. That's classical going back to Riemann. And what was needed about Hodge theory in this case is the Poincaré complete reducibility theorem. That if you have an abelian variety and an abelian subvariety, then up to finite coverings, uh, that splits. That is, it's a semi-simplicity theorem for abelian varieties. That 
semi-simplicity theorem of monodromy really a weighted Deline and mixed Hodge theory. Uh, that's why we, Hodge, that the Lefschetz Picard argument really needed a Hodge theoretic result that only was available when you had mixed Hodge theory, that is the polarized Hodge structures on the hyperplane sections. Finally, the vanishing theorems, uh, just a few words here. The Italian algebraic geometers were, had extraordinary geometric intuition and also a really deep understanding of, uh, of, of examples. But in the later period of Italian algebraic geometry, uh, they ran into things that they suspected, but they couldn't prove. They even uh, came across things that they, can, that they suspected were true that turned out not to be true. What was missing was H1, the first cohomology. Uh, so how does Hodge theory enter into the first cohomology of sheaves on algebraic varieties? Okay. So the point is that if you have the Lefschetz theorem, that's the first topological theorem, plus the existence of Hodge structures on ordinary cohomology, you get vanishing theorems. Okay. This goes back to the Kadara-Spencer argument for the Kadara-Akazugi-Nakano vanishing theorem. They proved it as a consequence of the Lefschetz topological theorem, the first Lefschetz theorem, plus just the existence of Hodge structures. And since then, that idea has been very profitably and deeply explored by many people. Uh, so the principle then is that the existence of a Hodge, of a functorial Hodge structure gives vanishing theorems. So that's another one of the uses, if you like, of Hodge theory in algebraic geometry. There are references to this, both classical and uh, more recent that are in the notes. So I think I will stop here. Um, thank you uh, very much for the chance to give this talk. Thank you so much. Uh, I imagine uh, um, there will be some questions or comments. Uh, so please ask a question if or comment or now. Maybe I just make one comment that uh, on the principle that in any talk, one should prove a non-trivial theorem. Uh, what I put in the appendix is a Torelli theorem for the first non-classical general type uh, algebraic surfaces. Uh, K squared is one, they're regular and PG is two. And there's a very nice picture of the Hodge theory of these surfaces and how the Hodge theory can help understand the moduli of these surfaces of work that was done by Franciosi, Pardini, and Rolinsky. Some very nice work and sort of giving Hodge theoretic interpretation of what they did. So, so Phil, I have um, just two very naive questions concerning um, what happens at the boundary. Um, the first question really is not on the boundary. It's uh, more to this uh, Torelli, generic Torelli theorem you mentioned of Schiffer Baron. Now, the generic, I guess it means uh, outside um, a finite set or outside a, a divisor? Uh, yes. I think the way I think of it is that uh, the mapping from moduli to uh, Hodge structures it has degree one. So outside a divisor, uh, it's, uh, it's biregular. So 
what you said that you take out of the space of, in this case, the elliptic surfaces for the shepherd Baron right. theorem, uh, you take out a certain subvariety, and in the complement, the hot structure uniquely determines the uh, the surface. And probably more interesting, at least to me, is if you give me the surface and its first variation, from that you can reconstruct the surface. So it's not just a degree one <laughs> statement, but the actual proofs are constructive in the sense that you give me the data and this is an algorithm, if you like, for reconstructing the variety. I'm just wondering, in the case of uh, the elliptic surfaces, um, I mean, if you have a base of higher dimension, for example, I mean, can you say more? I mean, are there counterexamples uh, to global Terrelli in that, in that setting? Yeah, I think, uh, Good, very good question and a couple of answers. The first is the generic global Torelli for elliptic surfaces that I'm aware of. Uh, the first one was proved by Ken Chikiris uh, back in the 80s. It's a very beautiful theorem. Uh, and there are a number after that of generic global Torellis for elliptic surfaces. What was particularly striking about the Shepard Baron one was the method of proof, which was not just a degree one statement, but it actually told you how to reconstruct the surface. If you go back to the Torelli theorem for K3s, uh, that in some sense is not constructive. If you give me the hard structure of a, of a K3, then unless it's a Coomer surface, uh, it, the proof does not tell you how to construct the K3, just as it's uniquely determined. Okay. Uh, the Chakiris argument was based on the uh, uh, proof for K3s. It's a degree one statement. The Shepard Baron thing is constructive in the sense that it's not only degree one, but you give me the elliptic surface and its first variation. And it's like this thing with the intersection of quadrics giving you the canonical curve. This is a geometric construction of the variety itself. Right. So I'm sort of wondering if you if you can. It's a constructive uh, approach, but if you add in you know a sufficient information from from variation hot structure or whatever, uh, uh, or mixed hot structure. Add in the first order. You know, in theory, you could add in higher order information. Maybe that's going to get much more complicated. But uh, for the Shepard Baron, you just add in the first variation, and right. from that data, you reconstruct the uh, the elliptic surface. But in theory, I imagine one can one should get a, a sort of a, a Torelli global Torelli with just dropping the generic hypothesis. But putting in a little more structure, you know, like variation, you no know, mixed hot yeah, structure. That's an interesting question, and uh, you know, I'm not sure. I don't know of a case where that's been successfully done. You mentioned cases where Torelli breaks down. Uh, so, an extreme case are the examples of algebraic surfaces, smooth, that are general type. <clears throat> in fact, have ample canonical bundle that are simply connected. Uh, so you can't get any Hodge theory off the fundamental group mm -hmm. that have no holomorphic two forms. Uh, so they have no Hodge, theory, no Hodge theory. The only Hodge theory is in the second cohomology group and the intersection form there. There's no Hodge decomposition or anything. It's all of type 1-1. One, one. <laughs> And they will have positive dimensional moduli spaces. So you can say, well, how is Hodge theory going to help you understand the moduli if you don't have any Hodge theory? And the one answer is, OK, let's rule out certain things. Let's, we don't know what the boundary of this moduli space looks like. We have no idea uh, how to get our hands on it but Hodge theory can at least rule out a bunch of stuff. So I gave 
uh, an ex a discussion of what would happen when you acquired uh, an elliptic singularity on a boundary surface. All right. right. If you have no Hodge theory, that construction can't take place, so you cannot have such a surface on the boundary. So one can extend this type of reasoning to say, even though there is no Hodge theory uh, that'll help you know what's on the boundary, you can at least use Hodge theory to give you some clue as to what cannot be on the boundary. <laughs> okay, that's not very helpful, but it is, you know, it's the only way I see of using Hodge theory in the sort of extreme case of surfaces smooth surfaces, which have no Hodge structure. I have no more questions. <laughs> are, there, are, there? Uh, are there any other questions or remarks? So I, I propose that we thank uh, Professor Gittis for his very nice talk. Okay. okay, yes, and again, thank you for the chance to give, uh, to give the talk.